Galatians. Uh, and a little bit of a background for those of you who may have missed part of this series. So the book of Galatians is a letter that was written by Paul to the churches in Galatia. Galatia is a region somewhere there. So Paul basically had planted some churches in this region called Galatia. And during that time when Paul was planting these churches, many Gentile people came to faith. And when I say Gentile people, what I'm referring is to uh, is the non-Jewish people. Many non-Jewish people came to faith in this reason. They believed in Jesus. After Paul left this region of Galatia to go and take the gospel to some other places, what began to happen is this. Some Jewish Christians from another region called Judea, they began to visit these churches that Paul had started. And when they came to these churches, they brought with them a new teaching. They insisted to them, listen here guys, what you have is great, but it is not complete. What you have is not enough. In addition to believing in Jesus, in addition to your faith in Jesus Christ, you also need to practice some aspects of the Jewish law as requirements for being accepted into the church. But at the moment, you gentle people, you are missing some things. All male Gentiles are to be circumcised, just like us, the Jews. You Gentiles are supposed to observe and participate in some of our Jewish festivals. You Gentiles are also to observe our laws when it comes to which foods to eat, which foods to not eat, and how to prepare the foods. We have our own set of halal laws, as we would say in Tanzania. And what began to happen is many Gentile believers began to fall for this type of teaching. And they obeyed it. And it was a very sad moment. And when Paul found this out, Paul was furious. And Paul basically takes out his pen and he begins to write this letter, which is known as the letter to the, Gen to the Galatians. And I think he wrote this letter with much, much tears. And today, we are in the second part of chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, from verse 11 to 21. Let me read. But when Cephas, who is called Peter, when he came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, Peter, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. 
For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Apparently, Peter had been happy to eat publicly with the Gentiles in fellowship. And you see, in this particular culture, eating together was an extremely important expression of fellowship. When you and I eat meals together, we show by that that we are one. We show that we are united. We demonstrate our unity that we belong to another. But it's also very important to remember here that the Gentiles, that's you and me by the way, the Gentiles were considered unclean according to the Jewish law. And so for a Jew to actually be sitting down and having a meal with a Gentile was haram. It was something which was forbidden because this Jew could end up becoming defiled. And so the fact that Peter a Jewish leader, a church father, the fact that he was happy to sit down and eat publicly with the Gentiles, this was an expression of his acceptance of them. Peter accepted them. That's why he could eat with them. But also for Paul, Paul had been fighting so hard for the Gentiles to be accepted on the basis of their faith alone. In Jesus. When Peter, the so called church father, when he visited them and he began to eat meals with them, with these Gentiles in public, this validated Paul's message. The gospel that Paul had been preaching and fighting for was finally getting accepted by a church leader, by a church father, the pillar himself, Peter. And for these Gentiles, these Gentile believers, for them to see Peter, a church father, stooping down to their level and eating with them, this must have made them so happy because it meant they were finally getting accepted into the church. It meant that they were finally being recognized as unique and equal members. Things quickly changed, however. One day, when some Jewish believers who still believed that Gentiles needed to become like Jews in order to be accepted, when they came into town, Peter, the church father, out of the fear of criticism, he decides to become a coward. And in a moment of public hypocrisy, he withdraws himself from eating with the Gentiles. And Paul was not at all impressed by this because Peter's actions were not in line with the truth of the gospel. Can you imagine the impact of Peter's actions? What it did to these Gentile believers? The divisions, the possible divisions that it could have caused. Maybe some of these new believers thought to themselves, this gospel that Paul is preaching Maybe it's not the truth. Because here is Peter, the church father. He is turning his back on us. Maybe this gospel that Paul is preaching to us is just meant for the Jews and not for us. Maybe we need to become like the Jews in order to truly be saved. Or maybe we, we Gentiles are simply second class Christians. And so Paul mustered up all the courage and he rebuked 
Peter to the face in public. Why in public? I believe it's because so much was at stake. Peter was an apostle and the truth of the gospel was compromised by him in public. And so a public rebuke was necessary. Can I just say that this is not a formula for how to correct a brother or a sister who is in error. This is not a formula. This was a unique moment that warranted a unique response. The Bible actually encourages us to use private confrontation before it actually escalates to public confrontation. That's found in Matthew chapter 18. But of course, there may be times when a public rebuke is necessary. But the heart of the matter is that we all need to have courage to confront one another. And even our leaders, especially if they do or say something that is contrary to the truth of the gospel. I don't think it was easy for Paul to rebuke Peter. But nonetheless, he did it because it was the right thing to do. And I know that for us, many of us in our African culture, to rebuke a leader or to confront a leader is something that is seen as a taboo, especially in public. Man, you will get killed if you confronted a leader in public. But I sometimes wonder if one of the big reasons why false teachers and false doctrines are flourishing so much, especially here in the African continent, is it because maybe we as Africans, we never speak out against them. We never feel compelled to challenge them. And as a matter of fact, for many of us, we entertain ourselves with these things. It's become simply a talk of the day. Pastor so-and-so declares himself as God's right-hand man. And it's like, ha, ha, ha. We take it simply as a laughing matter. But dear friends, when the truth of God's word is compromised, we have to speak up. When eternal lives are at stake, we have to speak up. When leaders of false teachings that deceive people and lead them astray, it's not a laughing matter. It's a serious thing, and we need to say something. I'm sure that both uh, Sheshi and Jeremy fully agree to this. But here at God's tribe, please, 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 feel free to ask any questions. Feel free to confront. If there is anything or in any way that we may not be in line with the truth of God, please confront. Ultimately, we desire to be a church that honors the word of God. After Paul's confrontation incidents with Peter, Paul goes on to touch on the theological logic that he was using when he rebuked Peter and the others. And it, let's read in Galatians chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Paul says, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. And so the dilemma in these verses is about how is a person justified before God? Is it by works of the law or is it by faith? And that word justification is used in a legal sense. And what it means is to be declared and treated as righteous before God. And so as we read this verse, it seems that Paul is not simply speaking to unbelievers, but rather he is appealing to the Jews. He's appealing to the Jews who have accepted Jesus as their Savior. He's appealing to the Christian. 
He says, yet we know as Jews, as Christians, that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And so it would seem that these Jewish believers accepted that Jesus Christ died for their sins. But somehow, the reason they still dependent on the law was that because it was their culture, it was their way of life. But they would often fall back into the old way of thinking, a thinking that says observing the Mosaic law is enough to make them right in God's eyes. And Paul is not about to give this type of thinking a chance. Paul is basically saying to them, guys, if you needed Jesus to die for your sins in order to make you right with God, then this means that keeping the law didn't help you. The law didn't justify you. The law didn't make you right with God. That's why you needed Jesus. And so it seems that these guys didn't know exactly what they believed in and why they believed it. Like so many of us as believers. Here's the thing, guys. Being good doesn't justify you. Being good will not earn a place for you in heaven. We are saved by Jesus dying for our sins. Full stop. The law is good, but it doesn't save anybody. Jesus is the gospel. Jesus' death is the good news. And so in his reasoning, Paul is ultimately leading these people who are reading this. That if the Jews are trusting Jesus for salvation and not the law, this means that we are on the same level as the Gentiles before God. And he sums it up so well in verse 21 when he says, If righteousness were through the law, then Christ would have died for no purpose. Which means for a Jew to refuse to associate with a Gentile, it's hypocrisy. How can a Jew pretend to be better than a Gentile? How can a Christian pretend to be better than anybody for that matter? Because we are all in need of the same grace. We are all in need of the same grace. So there is no one better. We are all on the same level. I remember uh, not very long time ago, I caught a bajaj down from my house to come to church on Sunday morning. And my bajaj driver was a young man. His name was David. And as we were busy driving to church, we spoke about a few things. But one of the things that came up was that David said he sort of was a Christian. But I quickly figured out that David was really just a young man who was still searching. And I began to ask him if he attends any church, seeing that it was a Sunday morning. Why wasn't he himself at any church? Now David had a very, very interesting looking hairstyle. He had like a patch of dreadlocks right in the middle of his head. And around his dreadlocks, he had literally shaved off everything. It's, he sort of looked like Mr. T, if, if those of you who remember Mr. T, but even more interesting than Mr. T. And David told me the church would not accept him with his hairstyle. And so he had given up going to church. And I remember thinking to myself, how sad that a young man who is searching for truth can be rejected by Christians simply because of his choice of hairstyle. I have met people who refused to go to church because they feared that they didn't have the right clothes. They would not be able to fit in there. I met a brother who felt that he somehow needed to fix his life before going to church. He was not perfect enough. And as he was telling this to me, I thought to myself, what did this brother see and observe in the church that made him think that the church is for perfect people? Is any of us perfect here? Absolutely not. We are all sinners who desperately need Jesus. In Mark chapter 2, verse 17, Jesus, when he was speaking to the Pharisees, 
he said, those who are well have no need for a doctor. But those who are sick, I didn't come for the righteous, but I came for sinners. Friends, the church is not some sort of social club for perfect people. The church is a place for people who are in need of Jesus. I come here every Sunday because I need somebody to stand here in the front and actually do exactly what I'm doing and remind me that I need Jesus because I so easily forget that. I need somebody here to check on me and to be praying for me because without people here checking on me and praying for me, I struggle to stand as a Christian. As a matter of fact, if I went to a church and I found out that all the people in there were perfect, I don't think I'd be able to stay there. I will not fit in because I am not at all perfect. Many times we as Christians, we have been accused of being too critical. We are accused of pretense. We are accused of hypocrisy. We are accused of being too judgmental. You hear statements like, Jesus, I like. But his people, the Christians, not so much. I don't like those people so much. But I do not believe it's meant to be like that. On the contrary, as Christians, because we have received so much grace, we have received the very thing that we do not deserve, shouldn't we be the most gracious people on the earth. I think Christians are meant to be the most authentic people with their lives. We are meant to walk freely. We are meant to walk without hiding our faces behind the mask. We have nothing to hide. We are to remove the mask. The gospel should free us from pretending as if we are perfect because we are not. Because it is Christ himself that justifies us. And he has justified. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Why should we still be walking around like condemned people? Hiding and pretending. It's not necessary. And then in verse 17 and 18, Paul writes, But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were, fa were found to be sinners. Is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. So Paul is saying here to the Christian Jew, listen here guys. If we as Jews have also depended upon Jesus for justification, that means we suddenly begin to realize that we are also sinners like the rest. We are also sinners like the Gentiles. We are no longer Jews who walk around simply thinking that we are secure because we observe the law. No, we are sinners. And this can make us feel vulnerable. This makes us feel a certain loss of control. And then Paul says, does this mean that Jesus somehow makes us a sinner when we never used to be before? And Paul says, no. That is foolish thinking. Why? And verse 18 answers that. He says, for if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. The irony is that Jesus' death on the cross proves that the law failed to justify mankind. That's why he needed to die, in order to justify mankind. And so, the law promoters are the ones who basically have now become the law breakers. I remember two years ago, uh, I was invited to a church uh, in Kibamba. Kibamba is just on the outskirts uh, of Dar es Salaam, on your way to Morogoro. Uh, and as you can see, I like to wear two rings. I have this ring here and this ring here. I like to wear two rings. But before I got up in front of that church to start teaching, my friend who had come with me, who had accompanied me, my friend quickly pulled me to the side. And as he pulled me to the side, I could see 
a little bit of embarrassment in his face. And he basically came, Samahani Kaka. And he was apologizing. He was saying, brother, I'm very sorry. But I think you need to take the other ring off. If people see you wearing two rings, they might think you're not saved. What I say, Some of them actually might even think maybe one of the ring is the source of your power. You're using witchcraft. And to be honest, I was shocked a little bit. And quite honestly, I was a bit embarrassed. I kind of felt like a second-class Christian to this church. And so with shame, I kindly removed the ring before going up to teach. But it made me wonder, who comes up with such laws? Is it even based in the Bible? Friends, if you preach or believe a gospel that says, in order to be saved, you need Jesus plus baptism. In order to be saved, you need Jesus plus communion. In order to be saved, you need Jesus plus church attendance. Or you need to wear a suit to church. Then according to Paul, you are a lawbreaker. Because you are teaching and believing a false gospel. And you need to repent. In verse 19 to 21, Paul says, For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Paul says here that he has died to the law. And what he means is that he has died to the Pharisaic idea that he can somehow save himself by a devotion to the law. And remember, Paul used to be a Pharisee when it came to the law. Paul used to obey the law so well that it had become his identity. And say, for him to say that he has died to the law, it's a big statement. Friends, the law of God, as is revealed in the law of Moses, what it did was it showed us the true nature of our sin and the corruption that is in our hearts. You see, the law acts like a mirror, or it almost was like a mirror. The law shows you how you truly are. As you look at the law, you quickly discover that you are a sinner. The law itself is right. The law itself is good because it reveals that God is holy and it reveals that the standard that God requires is a standard of holiness. But Paul is saying what we found is that we are unable to keep the law. Romans chapter 3 verse 23, Paul says, All of mankind have sinned and broken the law of God. There is not even one person who has been able to fulfill that law. There is not even one person who is right before God. And Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, The punishment for breaking the law is death. The wages of sin is death. And so Paul says, we need to die to the law in order to live to God. But how? And verse 20 answers that. In verse 20 he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a very famous verse. So the moment Paul came to faith in Jesus, the moment Paul realized and repented of his sin and placed his trust in Christ, it was like Paul was on that cross with Jesus Christ. And Jesus 
was a genuine substitute for Paul in such a way that it actually ended his law-governed life that was full of condemnation. And it killed also the inner rebellion that he could never get over. So Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. When Jesus died, the old Paul died. So that the new Paul is different. And the life that he now lives is a different life. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. This isn't just Christianese words. Paul is being sincere. Because of the cross and the resurrection, his life now isn't lived under the law. And the days of self-effort and striving so hard to meet the demands of the law. Paul is saying those days are over. And in verse 20 he says, The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The new life that he now lives is a life of faith. The old life was a life of self-effort. The new life is a life that is lived by faith. The old life was governed by the law. The new life is enabled by grace. I remember uh, the What Would Jesus Do movement. And the What Would Jesus Do movement was basically, it was basically just a bracelet that we used to wear. Uh, and every time you were in a situation, uh, before you do something, you always had to ask yourself, what would Jesus do? And you sort of tried to figure out what Jesus would do in this situation. And you tried to do that. I, I remember I really liked that thing. And I tried to follow it. But many times I failed. I, I failed to do what Jesus would do in many instances. But for Paul, what he's saying is that it's more than that. Paul says, I am sick and tired of self-effort. I am sick and tired of trying to please God by the power of the flesh. Paul says, I have now surrendered my life. I have now died. I no longer live for myself, but I live fully for Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself lives through me. And so for Paul, instead of asking what would Jesus do, and then trying to pursue it in the power of the flesh, in his own effort, Paul says, I will simply yield myself and let Jesus do it through me. I will simply yield myself and let Jesus do it through me. And this is the challenge to all of us here this morning. Friends, we are called to yield our lives. We are called to surrender ourselves to Jesus. Stop trying to please God with your own efforts. It's a waste of time. It's useless. You will fail. Lord Jesus, thank you for this wonderful morning. Jesus, thank you that you are the one who presents us before God. Thank you that we are justified outside of ourselves. Lord, in of ourselves, we are totally incapable of pleasing you. Lord, we continually fail you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you did what we could never do on that cross. And this morning we celebrate you and we bless your name. Amen.